So, I mean, I went through a wilderness for... I got saved in 1999, went to church for four years. Um, things um, turned a bit nasty there and um, I prayed. Uh, what happened, I'll tell you what happened. What happened was um, uh, after th like, and I've told you before, this, this is what made everything go haywire. I was, um, every day I'd get up, and I encourage you to do this. Every day I'd be praying, and I'd say to God, and I told you this, I told some of you might remember this, e every day, like, because I was full of, like, fear and guilt and condemnation and stuff. I mean, when I, had a, when I got saved, I had a radical transformation. The alcoholism went, the dope addiction went, the, the um, suicidal thoughts, the nightmares, the paranoia, the anxiety, and uh, the depression. Everything just went bang like that. I wasn't perfected, but that was a great start for me. And I'm just going, whoa, this God, who is he? And this, you know, where I never ever wanted to pick the Bible up, I had a hunger. From that day, I had a hunger to read, 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 read. And like I said, I was reading the Bible um, three times a year, the New Testament, one, one time a year, the Old Testament. And I kept that up for like, probably kept it up for 16, 17 years. And then now I just go wherever I want to, um, wherever God wants me to, or I was doing that before. But... um. Like, I'd pray every morning, or, God, what do you want me to do? What do you save me for? You know, I still had self-condemnation or, you know, rejection of self through the just the crap that you put up with life. Just wondering why he saved me, why he did, you know, because it was a massive release. I was just like floating for about three months, and I kept praying this um, probably for, um, I would say, Two years, two years every day I'd put in my prayer, God, what do you want me for? Show me what you want me to do. What did, what did you, you save me for? You know, I'm looking at all my mates, trying to get them saved. None of them are interested. But I couldn't get enough of it. I just couldn't get enough of God. He just filled me right up with his spirit, with light, with life. And anyway, um, after about, I think it was about two and a half years, he said, one day I heard an audible voice. He said, after three and a half years, you'll know. So I said, right. And I, I, I got the date. I know the date will say February 11th, 1999, about 11 in the morning. My life's never been the same again. Best, things, best thing that happened ever. And uh, from that date, I just worked out, got the calendars out. I didn't have an internet or a phone. I had to get the count, counting this and that, and then right, right oh, and going through it a few times, right, this is the date. This is the date, if that was you, God. And I knew it was God because I'd been asking and asking and asking. I said, right, on this date is three and a half years after I was born again. And I was happy with that. I never asked him again. I believed it was him. And anyway, so another like nine months went on and nothing was going on. We're getting closer to the date and I'm thinking, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? So anyway, my father rings up at um, about, what was it? Oh, probably two, two weeks, no, three weeks before maybe. No, two weeks before. And he said, oh, you better come over. Me, your mother's sick and um, she's, in, uh, she's got cancer and she's nearly dead. And uh, she's only got a month to live or something. And anyway, I thought, oh no, that's no good. And then, but I'm thinking, maybe this is God. He's, something's going to happen over here. Something good. He's going to show me what he wants me for. So I went over there. I didn't get on with my mother. I hadn't seen her for years. And uh, anyway, it was a bit of a cool reception. But I got there the night before. Like, I couldn't get there straight away because I had work commitments, had things to do. I had to wait two weeks to the very day, uh, the, sec the day before the, the day that. God told me the date that I had in mind, so I had to wait. And uh, the day before I got there, I went up home, and Dad said, "Come out." And, and uh, he said, "No, you can't come in now. She's asleep." So I just walked off. I mean, God wouldn't even let me in the door that night or that day. So I just walked off. I'd been around the town like a, a couple of days, 
And everyone in the town was saying, oh, sorry about your mother, sorry about your mother, she's, uh, yeah, and I'm saying, what do you mean, she's not dead yet, you know, I had faith God was going to do something, I had total faith something was going to happen, I didn't know what, but, you know, half a dozen people, because they ain't a little town like um, Exeter, probably smaller, heaps smaller actually, and everyone knew everyone, and I said, yeah, she's not dead yet, you just go a bit easy, you know. Anyway, the next day I walked up and I walked up about nearly to the very minute that I was saved. I walked in, I've looked into the, um, Dad's let me in and I've stuck my head around the corner and seen my mother, no hair, no, everything, just looking like a skeleton. Death was all over her. And, um, like, and I heard, as I looked around, I heard these two words, loud and clear, death and cancer. And I thought, right, and I had heard about casting out demons. I knew about the self-deliverance and I knew about the battles that came after, you know, the, the, the grace, the, the salvation or, or the born-again grace had gone and then the battle in me started happening. So I, I, was, I, I didn't really know what to do, but I knew I had to do it. And anyway, I, I, got, I, I, re, I said sorry to Mum for being a, like a bad kid and stuff and we had to make up like you know try to connect in a bit of a way and anyway and we did and she was a bit you know hard too and after about 20 minutes half an hour we all, i led her in a prayer the our father prayer i told her i'm born again things are different god saved me and she grew up in a catholic home and she probably never ever thought that stuff would uh, come out of my mouth because uh, I couldn't wait to get out of the flaming Catholic Church when the, when Dad was dragging us there, I tell you. Anyway, as soon as she finished that, our Father's Prayer, righteous anger really um, came up in me, and I knew it was God, and I just said, I bind you, spirit of death. Well, I might have said cancer first, whatever it was, I bind you cancer in the name of Jesus Christ, I rebuke you, command you to leave, you've got to get out, I cast you out in Jesus' name, and I bind you spirit of death in the name of Jesus Christ, you've got to leave, you've got to get out of me mother right now in the name of Jesus Christ, and, uh, and that was all I said, but that was enough, I felt that that was enough, didn't feel to go on, and anyway, um, then uh, she, uh, we're just talking, and within five minutes, probably, yeah, about five minutes, she said, tell Dad to get me some two-minute noodles, I'm hungry. And I'm going, you beauty. And then uh, I said to Dad, how long since she's eaten? Well, it's been two weeks since she's ate anything. I mean, they were pumped. She had the chemo thing pumping right into her heart, you know, and she was, like, right on the... um verge of uh like she wouldn't had not much longer to go but i didn't see anything didn't see anything move but i knew them pray prayers had hit the target i didn't know anything i didn't know our deliverance or you had to like keep it up or do this or do that knew nothing i went down i think i went home the next morning back to tassie and anyway i found out in the night that night me they thought she was dying and my sister was there and holding the bucket under and she was, she was, she was coughing up, spewing up all this black gunk and all that crap was coming out of her, you know, and it was massive, like it was a great, like that was, that was God setting her free. Not when I was there, that was him doing and I had nothing to do with it. And then I thought, wow, is that what you want me to do? Heal the sick, cast out demons, right out. Anyway, um, I was really like high on that. Thought everything right, I'm just in. I'm like, you know, the Apostle Paul, I'm just going to save the world and everything. Nothing really went right after that, but... That was me start. That was the um, destiny God had given me. And I'd got a good word uh, a, a, a year and a half after I was saved. Actually, might have been two and a half years. I can't remember if... if um, 
Yeah, yeah, I think this. I think I done that after this prophetic word that I'll play ya. And um, yeah. So anyway, I've come back to the church and told them all, and that, they didn't believe it. They didn't believe it. I'm saying this is what happened. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's good. No, none of them wanted to listen. And I could see. Is there a bit? What are you envious or jealous? Something's going on. Why don't you talk about? You get up. You talk about your miracles or miracles in the bible but you never talk about your own if someone wants to talk about them and you just you don't want to hear you know and that frustrated me and then i, I got into trouble in that church because i was reading the word and uh th three after four years an audible voice told me spoke to me and said as i was praying for the church don't go and anyway I said god they they tell me if i don't go i'm going to go to hell i'm going to go uh, if i don't tithe i'm going to go to hell if i don't obey the elders i'm going to go to hell if i don't do this i'm going to hell or do that blah 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 and then he said anchor yourself in the word another audible voice and i'm going dancing around the land room going you beauty you beauty i don't have to go to church anymore and i felt the freedom you know and then i was on my own path to make all my own mistakes without anyone influencing but um before that i <laughs> Yeah, my mother got better, but she only got better for nine, ten months. She she bought a camper van, drove up to Queensland. But what happened? She um my brother went around and he knew he was a Christian and he knew that when I prayed something happened and he's gone around the town, all these people expecting her to die, and he's saying, Peter prayed for mum and she got healed. And then mum went around town afterwards saying it wasn't bloody Peter, it was the chemo. And I'm thinking, fair dinkum, you know, you just can't can't win. But that was the the rejection that I got from her like for years, so that didn't surprise me. But she did. She got ten more months then the cancer came back and um it was uh she uh she passed away. I had a dream actually, a, a voice spoke to me and said the cancer's come back. Mm -hmm. Instead of praying and fasting, like I did a three day fast before. I just thought, yeah, well, it was easy last time. I'll just go and do it again. <laughs> but it, um, yeah, it didn't really, I didn't have any, well, she said when I was laying hands on her, she could feel it going in, but she passed away a few days later. But um, she was a lot more softer, a lot more open to it. And we found um, Christian music in a glove box. Yeah, because she was hard. She was an alcoholic, you know, and... Yeah, so I, I believe she's made it. Um, yeah, I could go on there, but anyway, back to the um, the church bit. I, I got our church, but what happened before, in between the six months between my mother's healing and the church, um, me getting out of the church, there was another bloke, and um, uh that we were doing this ministry it was a platform ministry where they're encouraging everyone to get up and just share share something for five minutes encouraging them to speak and anyway it was good everyone was having an opportunity one of the elders was running it and um someone else was going to have a go and he said no we've run out of time we're going and you can't go and he said oh well it's only a couple of minutes nah, nah, we're finished we're finished and uh, anyway, the thought came to me, that's a bit hard, you know. Why, why don't you just let him speak? What's the difference another five minutes, mate? And um, anyway, he wouldn't let him. We're all out the door. But an vo audible voice spoke to me then and said he'll be gone in six months. And I'm thinking, fair dinkum. I mean, I'm looking around. What, who, who's, who's that? You know, I knew who it was. Or well, why tell me that? And on the way home, possible and now I'm driving home. Why tell me that guy? What am I going to do with that? Do I go and tell him? Do I just wait? Or what do I do with that? And then I, I'm praying over a couple of days. And he said he had to fulfill this prophecy that was spoken over him. Um, that, yeah, the fellow was a, a Maori. And he had to, him and his, he married an Australian wife. And they had to go back to reconcile the blacks and the whites over in New Zealand. If you even call them blacks, they might call them browns. I don't know what they call them, Maoris. And anyway, that was the prophecy spoken over them. But they didn't, they didn't fulfill it. 
And I asked God, I said, well, what, what do I do? And he said, if he goes back, as soon as his feet touch that New Zealand soil and he starts walking in his prophecy, he'll be healed. And I, and I told him that. I went, I went and told the pastors, the elders. He started to get sick. Yeah, he started to get sick. I said, if he gets sick, um, I'll go and tell him. And about four months later, he starts breaking out in these big brown bl blotches. And I'm going, oh, no. Because I didn't like confronting anyone or, you know, I, I wasn't someone to go and talk serious to anybody, you know. Yeah, and anyway, they're taking him around, all these healers, all these um, whatever, the people with all these gifts apparently, and nothing was happening. So I went and told the elders that the pastor, we had a meeting, and I said, this is what's going on. This is the, the um, voice I heard, and this is the date. From six months to there, like the date I got off, um, I said, this is the date. If he's not, um, if he don't go by then, he's going to die. And uh, anyway, they said, yeah, right, I will go and tell him. And anyway, I went back in about three weeks, and I said, did you go and tell so-and-so uh, about what I said? Oh, no, nah, we didn't get round. I said, what? I'm telling you, he's going to die on this date. You, sh you should have told him. And he said, no, nah, you can go and tell him. And I'm only like a three, probably three and a half year old. Actually, no, this was right at the end of the four years. So I went and um, I went into the lounge room and said, look, um, this is, and told him the whole story, heard the audible voice, believe this is the word for you. And she said, yep, that word's been spoken over us. We believe we've got to fulfill that. And I said, well, um, you better think about it real hard and get yourself moving because if you don't do it by this date, your husband's going to be dead. And I'm talking to the wife. The wife was full of Jezebel. And uh, anyway, or well, actually, yeah, that was what I said. And um, I, I actually, I didn't say the date there. I just said, look, you got, this is what God's told me. I believe I got to tell you. And anyway, I went home and she's rang up three days later and she said, well, Thank you for the word. I actually, um, we actually had three thousand dollars saved for that trip, but we decided to buy a new car instead. And I said, "You, you know, I didn't swear at her. I said, right oh, then your husband is going to be dead on this date." And that was it. Hung up the phone. And anyway, guess what date he died? And they're accusing me of witchcraft. They're accusing me of this. I, I went. And that was it. And God, that's when God said, don't go, you know, forget it, forget them. You know, they're, and they're still going around circles in the same place. But that's what started me wilderness. I'm, and, and I went to another church up the road for 12 months. So I'd walk in there. They were connected with this church. I just wanted fellowship with me mates. Some of me mates before I was saved were going there or one of them was. And I had another couple of blokes who were pretty good. And I walked into that um, church every Sunday for 12 months. And uh, the pastor, it was only 15 people in it. The pastor and his wife only spoke to me about three times. When I walk in, they turn their back because they heard, they thought I was in witchcraft. They thought this and they thought that and all the rest of the crap. And I've got a few other good stories, if they're good, bad about what's going on or what these things that God's given me to do, the messages he's given me to deliver. But anyway, so I got sick of that. I pr played this prophecy to him. The very last time I went, I said, oh, they talked about Lynn Perry and John Jackson. I mean, some of you might recognize the name. Some of you might. And they're Yankee prophets. They come out. Lynn Perry was actually one of Ronald Reagan's bodyguards. But they really hit the nail on the head. But anyway, they spoke about this and I played them the prophecy. And as soon as I played them the prophecy, the next Sunday, oh, how are you? Nice to see you. Yeah, right. And I'm thinking, you are pathetic. And I left. I just couldn't stand it. I thought you, you ignored me for 12 months and now you want to, you know, pat me on the back. I can't stand this hip hypocrisy. So I left. I ended the wilderness. Here's the wilderness. that I, um, We started an FGB group like a man's group, and that went good for a couple of years. Then someone moved away, this one moved away, this one left, you know. It all just, and uh, because we were making a bit of difference, 
we made like, or I made 9,000 of these testimony DVDs, were handing them out for nothing and had people knocking on the door, even at Pine Gana, drug addicts and alcoholics, and they went through all the, the prisons in um, uh, New South Wales. They were going overseas and stuff like that. And um, yes, good things were happening, and then all of a sudden it faded off, and I was by myself in Pine Gana. Just um, wondering, what's next, God? What's next? What's next? And anyway, in between, we went to Africa. We went to, um, uh, yeah, we went all over the place. I was making every mistake under the sun. I couldn't fit anywhere in any church, any anyone. They weren't just weren't on the same path as I was. I couldn't connect with anyone, even me mates. They just couldn't connect with me because, you know, the warfare I had to do because of coming out of the Rosicrucians and stuff and just the, 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 the other stuff that I was looking at, not the um, design formula that the churches were dishing out. I, was lo I could look at anything I want because I had no one, no one holding the reins, which sometimes is a mistake, I tell you, but a, a lot of times it was good, but I kept reading and reading and reading, but then anyway, I just went round and round and round in circles. I felt alone, felt rejected, felt, you know, discouraged, wondering what was going on. And then after a few, you know, you just, you start to get over them things. You start to, um, you start to grow. And, but this word that I got, this was the thing I held on to the whole time, this prophetic word. And when I got this, me and Poss, we got married, we went to the mainland and um, I started, we, we did, I got delivered of the alcoholism, but three months later we got married, we went on the boat and we thought, oh, we'll just have a drink with our tea. That, that was it. Bang. And like one drink and then one drink turned and I had a few beers with me mates on the mainland. Then I had a, then I started playing footy again and that was a bad move. And then it just started spiraling out of control and I couldn't, um, couldn't contain it and every time I'd get on it I'd be on my knees the next morning saying God forgive me forgive me this went on for like 12 months or even more and uh, I drank a bottle of whiskey you know sculled it after like like I used to and ended up cartwheeling down some steps and broke my neck like and put me back out God healed it though he healed it in a uh, healing meeting but yeah, it was sort of a bad roller coaster, and you know, I'm thinking I'm falling back, I'm falling back. I didn't want to, but I just kept falling back. And then these prophets were coming, and uh, to the church, and um, this is like after two years, was seventh of the seventh, two thousand and one. So that's about a year and a half after we were saved. Well, that's when I was drinking. That's what the day we stopped drinking. So I was probably yeah, a year and a. 15 months I was drinking, probably. And anyway, I'm, I'm getting filled with condemnation again, guilt and shame and all the crap that goes with the sin, you know, that any sin. And um, so they said, oh, it'd be good if you can fast for three days, told the whole congregation. And uh, that way God might give you a better word or God might, they might be able to see clear or whatever they said. And so I tried to fast, couldn't even do that. Done one day and maybe a couple of hours. I thought, I can't even do that, God. Look at me, I'm a flaming wreck. And I'm thinking, these blokes, when they line up, because these are pretty famous prophets, when they line up, um, they're going to know what i am been doing, you know drinking and flaming, carrying on with the boys and being an idiot. And anyway, um, they came, uh, they came, and this is the word. I, I was expecting a smack on the bum from God. I really thought it was he was going to hit me hard, you know. But this is the word. I'll play it to you. This, this amazed the whole congregation. Um, and really encouraged me and this word when I got that that last Sunday that was it uh, on the Sunday I never drank again never I've never had a drink again drink again I had a little bit of port at a Anglican communion there one oh, 20 years ago or whatever 
but I've never ever touched another drop. And this, this word, when the true prophetic word goes into your spirit, it, it does what it's meant to. It, it changes you. It fills you with direction, fills you with hope. You know, and that's what I needed because I was starting to get more and more hopeless. Um, so this is it. John Jacks is first thing. He goes for five or six minutes. And this, they didn't know me from Bar of Soap, but what they were saying was hitting the target right on, right on the head, you know. Son, I am bringing you into a peace and understanding of surrender to the Spirit of God and to the Lord God Almighty, for you have been one who says, I want God to take the reins of my life, but... No, I don't. I want to back. I want to control this. I want to guide this. And then you said, I oh, will turn it all over. And then, well, I'm not sure if he'll do what I want. So maybe I shouldn't. And I'm causing there to come a new stability and a new confidence and a new trust within your heart. That there is a God who cares for you, who looks for your good, and you can trust him. I want you to begin to look outwardly to those that have needs within their lives that are around about. I want you to begin to not look back, but I want you to look with an eye to the future, for I'm going to cause you to become more and more of an influence. I want you to walk into places uh, where there are decisions that are being made that will influence community, will influence life. I want you to become more and more a voice and not one who sits on the sidelines and says, Oh, yeah, they should do this, and I wish they would do that, or at least thinks those things. But I want you to lift your voice up. I want you to become influential. I want you to influence them. I want you to be one that stands firm in that which you know to be right. Daughter of the Lord, I have put great strength within you. I'm going to cause you more and more to become stability. I'm going to cause you to be one who others can come to, come alongside of, and have great confidence that they can share their hearts, and it will be that which will be taken to the Lord and no further. That it will not be something that's talked about or chided over, but it will be that which is a strength to them that they have a confidant that they can come to and share the burdens of their hearts. Have one who would stand with them with that capacity of counsel, wisdom, and care. I'm giving you strength to speak forth. I'm going to cause there to come more and more an aspect of unity within your lives together as you walk in purpose in God. That it would not be as though I got my purpose in my way and I've got my purpose in my way, but that there would be a, a unity in that as you focus on what God is opening up to you in these days. I will cause you to get more and more established in the ways of God and in the house of the Lord to bring forth truth, to bring forth life in those that you come in contact with. Brother and sister, I, I have a great feeling that, and I don't want to preempt what others are saying, but that there is a, a uh, it's as though that God is showing the next step, but not showing too much further out there because he wants you to get stronger and take one step at a time and have an understanding that there is a dimension of faith that he is calling you into where you don't have to have the plan laid out before you. You don't have to see everything that is there, but you have to see him. And as you see him, the great confidence rises within your hearts that we will walk this walk, we will talk this talk, we will see the faith that God has called us unto arise within our hearts. Brother, the picture I get is very similar to what Brother John said. It's like that uh, it, it is time, well, in, in the past, imaginations has come to your heart and said, why don't they do? Why is it they do? And it has been a reason for you to be able to say, well, I won't have to really commit myself that much because uh, those folks don't have it together. And the Spirit of God is going to cause you in your mind to stand before the throne of eternity and to see heaven and hell, life and death. That there will be from the depths of your being, this is who I am, this is why I live, this is my destiny. And where others stand with me or not, I will use no one else as a reason, no excuses. 
It's just my play with the living God. And son, I'm going to cause you to have a time, even shortly, where you're going to come face to face with the reality of who and what you are, that it cannot be what others say and what others think that shall mold your life, that it shall be out of your innermost being a relationship, covenant with the living God. For there has been a hunger that I have been putting within you to go after and to train, to equip, to teach. And there has been a holding back because, Lord, if I don't have it together and they don't have it together, maybe we ought to wait until we get it together. But no one has it together. No one understands all things. No one is balanced. Everyone walks with the Lamb. Everyone that is called of God walks with the Lamb. Everyone has need of my ongoing daily touch, counsel, guidance, revelation and leadership. No one understands the turns around the next corner. Everyone has to walk by faith. And I am giving unto you, son, even a clear statement that I have chosen you. I have gifted you. I have strengthened you. I have encouraged you. And I have brought you back from the precipice over and over and over and I will give unto you the determination I'm going to stand as a man of God with my armor on, with my eyes on the horizon, always on the look to strengthen and encourage and bless those who are weaker than I, to be unto them an encourage or a blessing that they will not fail, that they will not go through the same battles I have, but I will show them the trail, how to walk, how to do, how to be a blessing everywhere they turn. Daughter of the Lord, attach yourself even more so with those that would pray, that would intercede. Express your burdens, express your concerns, but also know that I will speak unto your heart my desire, that as you give yourself unto the things that I've been speaking unto you, I will heal what you can't heal. I will restore what you cannot restore. I will give unto you wisdom to speak into situations that you wonder, well, how'd that get in my mouth? And I will put within you a word of wisdom and the ability to bring rest and peace when it seems like there is no peace. I will bless you, says the Lord. Yeah, so that was the word that was sown into me, changed me life, you know, totally. And I had a direction, I had a hope that I could walk in. And... Um, so I just, I mean, they got that on tape, obviously, and I listened to that a dozen, 20 times, I don't know how many, because I needed hope, I needed a direction. I, I, when I went into the church, I wanted to hold on to man's hand, because I'd never um, always just been like monkey see, monkey do sort of a, a bloke, you know, easily led and uh, just, yeah, but this time, and I went into church, I was looking for someone to counsel me, to guide me, to like take me under their wing and teach me about Christianity. I couldn't find anyone that like would tell me the stuff that I probably wanted to know or even needed to know. And anyway, this, uh, yeah, so God wanted me to separate from the people, you know, and that it wasn't them that rejected me. God made them reject me. It was God got me out of that place any way he could. I mean, I'm not blaming them. It's like Joseph, he never blamed his sons when he, he um, uh, his brothers, when they sold him in the wilderness there. He realized it was the work of God for him to go through the wilderness and then, um, you know, uh, become the second in charge of Egypt. It was all God's plan. And this was the plan of God. But that, that was word was... It, like I said, I give up drinking straight away and my thought was, God, if I'm going to be something, you're never going to use me while I'm drinking. And I just said, I'm never going to drink again. That was it. I never did. And there was no like withdrawals or nothing. Like before, I'd have sugar withdrawals before I was saved, if I tried to give it up by myself. And not that I was very successful, but you know, when you're giving up alcohol, when you're drinking it every day, binge drinking, like, you know, you, um, like I was full on into it. You'd be eating cakes and lollies and chocolate and any, any sugary thing just to cr get rid of that craving. But this time there was none of that. And uh, anyway, that, that was the roller coaster. A roller coaster, you know, you get into depths of despair, then you get a victory and up and down and up and down and up and down. And I'll tell you something, I've only just come out of that wilderness. 
Only, this word's only just taken place, like what we're doing here. I did have the FGB group. I did have a um, group in Hobart, but they weren't as hungry as you. They were just coming for the food, I reckon. You know? <laughs> I'm serious. Yeah, I was making all these things up, and yeah, anyway, none of them sort of, none of them move forwards. But and that's the wilderness too. That's the confusion, the frustration, the um. You know, you've you got to keep going back to God. What are you, what's going on, God? You've got to be patient. And I wasn't patient, and but I knew I had a gift in me, and I'm going out looking for people to pray for, to cast out demons, heal the sick, whatever, you know, and uh, anyway, trying to save the world. And so, some, good, some good results and a lot of failed ones. You make yourself look like an idiot and shameful and that, and... You know, because you want to pray for people that don't want you to pray for them anyway. That's a bad move. You don't want to do that. But anyway, when I was in Hobart, I think, I mean, we just come out of Hobart. It's been six years ago we moved to Hobart. We've only been here 12 months from Pine Ganna. That's where we're living. Anyway, God said clearly, God give me the word of, to go down to Hobart. That was clear as anything. And I'm thinking, oh, finally out of the wilderness. We left at Pine Garner after 20 years. Right, she's all going to happen now. I'm in. And and then um, and I, I, we've been dealing with the ex-high priestess, you know, and I had all the evidence, all the proof of all the pictures which is have seen, you know, and surely the... the the church is going to listen to me now. <laughs> Guess what? They didn't want me. They, they didn't want to know nothing about it. it. It was really bad. And I pushed and pushed and pushed and uh, tried and got frustrated again, you know, and just tried. And I wasn't doing it for myself. I was doing it to wake them up because they're bragging about shutting the churches down, cursing the churches. I could see the div division and offence. They're still doing it. Every church, you know, if they're going well, the witches will come and curse it and it'll shut down or, or split, at least split. But uh, anyway, in the end, God said, I heard it real loud, um, don't go to them, let them come to you. And the hardest thing was after 20 years of trying to, um, or 18, whatever it was, trying to do me thing, trying to, you know, uh, do some witnessing or do some praying or do whatever that I, I had to sit and wait and I, I found it so hard to just sit and wait when he said don't go to them let them come to you so I stopped doing everything I just stopped bang right oh God I give up if that's the way you're gonna do it that's the way I'm gonna do it so anyway um sat there for I don't know a week or two or whatever and anyway some people, I started getting phone calls. Oh, they heard, people in the church has heard, because I went to a church there six months, done a bit of deliverance on some people in there, and I cast a demon out of Jezebel, out of an elder in the prayer group, and uh, they didn't like that, and I wasn't allowed back in the prayer group. <laughs> so anyway, I thought, well, maybe that'll wake them up, but didn't. Anyway, I... um. Yeah, so I had to sit and wait. Then all of a sudden the phone would start ringing. They were ringing. They started ringing around um, from all over Australia, even Africans ringing up because I had a bit of a Facebook site or my YouTube or something. They were finding out I was here and I wasn't even putting any effort in. So I started um, praying for them. And, and, you know, I was still only like, I wasn't an expert. I wasn't, a, you know, I wasn't perfect in everything. But there was results coming and they'd tell their friends and this had happened, that had happened. People started knocking on the door, you know, and um, and people, some, some people in the churches started coming, some high up people in the churches and uh, we started casting demons out of them and they, they, they because they were so oppressed, they, um, they started changing their um, theology because they got freedom in the deliverance. So, uh, that was encouraging, but nothing, no doors opened here till we come here. Exeter, this, this place, God's doing something up here, you know. You people are such an encouragement to me. I couldn't, I couldn't do this anywhere until like when Brad started his meetings there. He said, let's have a meet, and he rounded up some people, and we showed the slides on the witchcraft and all, all the stuff, you know. 
And anyway, things just started uh, to get, it's like bang, the wilderness is over for you. You move here, I mean, look at the house we've been given and stuff like that. And everything's just fitting into place. We're, we're so happy here, you know, especially with the people that are hungry, use people that are hungry. And uh, and have a look, remember that there was a, um, I don't know if you heard about what's going on. Something's going on in the West Tamar. We've been praying for it, you know, daily prayers. You, you I don't know if you have been praying, but you pray for your own area, but... Um, West Tamar, there's a thing going on in Port Hedland. This is nothing to do. This is not spiritual. Well, it is spiritual, but this is there's a thing where they're exposing what we, what we went through uh, in the last couple of years, exposing it as a hoax, as a, a fraud in the Port Hedland Council, and they've all been every council in Australia and every council member in Australia. I think it's five thousand three hundred and something has been given an email of how this there's so much contamination in these things and now um th there's a doctor here in west tamar right just down the road here that's um causing world headlines too you know think and she's really pushing it along here you know god's gonna set the captives free there's gonna be massive amounts of people coming out looking for help and you know this is and, and when god shows you you know if you seek him he'll give you the next step or he'll give you the next step he'll give you a bit of an idea about what's coming you know which way to turn so i believe these you know these training things and stuff what we've been doing especially with um the, the ex high priestess they're a bit radical but you learn so much in a short amount of time and um yeah, they've been really beneficial to the people that have uh, seen it and watched it. They believe. It makes you believe. It helps you just increase your faith. So that, that, that's my wilderness experience. And um, I believe I've just, I come out. I mean, there was lots of highs and lows. And then the roller coaster started to slow down, you know. It started to level out. And I, I didn't get frustrated or angry or, you know, there was times when I was. But if you've been on the roller coaster, you, you got to, and this is what this sheet's for. There is something at the end of it. You just got to be patient. And he's obviously, I, I took 20 years because I needed 20 years. I had to get all the crap out of my mind, all the stuff out of my heart, my pride, my self-righteousness, my self-serving, self-seeking, the lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, pride of life, all the wicked stuff, you know, that I had a lifetime picking up or 35 years picking up. All that had to go. The wilderness is to cleanse us and uh, clean us out. And um, some of you have been in long wildernesses, I know, you have told me, and you know, and... Um, but God will bring you out. This is the season He's bringing bringing the, the back, uh, bringing the people in the wilderness out. He's going to bring the backsliders in, and going to bring in those, even those that don't even believe. He's going to start bringing in because of what's going on with this thing. You know that truth is going to come out, and uh, He's going to need us to um, speak, uh, counsel them, or speak life, or give them. You know, pray. I believe we can just pray or sort them out or, you know, bring them into the kingdom, give them hope. And he's trained us for that. So that was my wilderness. I mean, there's so much more went on in between. Good, bad, the ugly, you know, but...